All right. Well, tonight's uh, speaker is Alana Vivani. She's a research assistant, senior research assistant with the Mount Arrowsmith Biosphere Region Research Institute. She was a uh, um, graduated Bachelor of Science in Biology from the Vancouver Island University in 2018. Uh, during that time, she studied sea otter foraging behavior and occupation time. And now she's involved in the Forage Fish Spawning Habitat Monitoring Project, project and wetland mapping. So she's um, busy with uh, lots of field work probably, uh, maybe not sure if it started yet, but <laughs> um, so tonight she's gonna be talking about Porridge fish, as you can see from the title. So, with that, I'll hand it over to Alana. Uh, thank you, Philip, again, and just thank you to Victoria uh, Natural History Society for having me. I would like to acknowledge that I am on the unceded traditional territory of the Sinanamo First Nation. Um, as you said, my name is Alana, and I'm an environmental project coordinator for the Mount Aerosmith Biosphere Region Research Institute, also known as MABRI. And today I will be speaking on our forage fish spawning habitat monitoring program. So to provide you just with a brief outline of what to expect this evening, I'm going to give a little bit of background information on Mabry and uh, the Mount Aerosmith Biosphere region. Um, I will dive a little bit into forage fish and the importance of monitoring, a look into our monitoring program and the citizen scientists who make it happen, the methodology that we use, some of our positive results. And lastly, we'll just tie it up with the brief mention of our bi-monthly newsletter, The Forager. In 2014, MABRI was established at Vancouver Island University as the engine behind the Mount Aerosmith Biosphere Region's research and educational programs. The MABR is a UNESCO designated biosphere reserve that spans from the News Bay north to Qualicum Bay. We are dedicated to community engagement, relationship building, and knowledge sharing. MABRI focuses on the research and community engagement initiatives, um, primar primarily within the UNESCO designated MABR, but we also uphold VIU's academic research plan by working on projects all across Vancouver Island. MABRI provides VIU undergraduates and graduate students with hands-on experience in their field, and we're able to set um, to tackle a really diverse set of projects through a lot of the interdisciplinary work that we have. Now, the reason why everyone is here, forage fish, what are they? They are these small, abundant schooling fish that are critical components to the marine ecosystem and fisheries. They are a key prey item for larger predatory fish, marine mammals, and seabirds. Pacific sand lance alone are prey to about 45 species of sport and commercial fishes, 40 seabirds, and 12 marine mammal species. More specifically, humpback whales, minke whales, and harbor seals depend on forage fish for about 75% of their diet. And they are grouped based on their ecological role as opposed to their taxonomy. So they play a really integral part in the marine food web. They influence both the predator and prey populations. Linking between the lower trophic levels and the higher trophic levels, they transfer energy throughout the food web. There is evidence that the dependent predator populations mirror forage fish population fluctuations, increasing or decreasing as a result of resource availability. In 2009, a study was conducted that showed approximately 34% of coho salmon diet consists of forage fish. And on Northern Vancouver Island, Pacific sand lance consist of about 65% of the diet of adult Chinook salmon, which we all know are um, a key prey item for the resident killer whales. There are seven species of forage fish that reside along the BC coast, including Pacific herring, Pacific sardine, northern anchovy, eulicon, surf smelt, and capelin, oh, and Pacific sand lance. Um, each of these species have different ranges that they frequent, different ecology, and different life cycles. 
But at Mavri and our forage fish program, we are specifically focused on surf smelt and Pacific sand lance. Their spawning habitat is similar and easily accessible for sampling. So forage fish and their spawning habitats are protected under the Federal Fisheries Act. However, at the time of the creation, there was minimal data available regarding location of forage fish spawning along BC's coast. Generally, Pacific sandlands and surf smelt use the upper intertidal zone of beaches on Vancouver Island and coastal BC for spawning and embryonic development, where the sediment is composed of a sand or a mixture of sand and, and pea and pebble gravel. While most people are used to herring spawning further down in the intertidal zone on eelgrass blades, Pacific sandlands and surf smelt are dispersed in the zone that is uncovered during a low tide event. So the photo on the right is from one of our sample stations in Nanaimo. And as you can see, that tape measure that you're seeing on the sand uh, generally shows the sample area that we're collecting sediment from. So really up high near the high tide mark. Now, due to the set of conditions required for suitable forage fish spawning habitat, these forage fish are exposed to several stressors. Literature has stated that overhanging vegetation is a beneficial feature as it keeps the sediment beneath it cool and moist, which can be especially important for summer spawning activity when you have high heat and lots of sun just baking the, um, baking the beach below. So loss of trees and vegetation from development can really pose negative effects on potential spawning habitat. Increasing temperatures due to climate change can also play a role in the lower survivability due to uh, extending beyond the thermal tolerance ranges and contributing to desiccation as they require suitable sediment to allow their eggs to attach to and for sufficient oxygenation. The construction of seawall armoring, such as lar large boulders, stone, or other rip-wrap structures, um, decrease the suitable sediment by having water hit the armoring and compact the sediment so much that the eggs are not able to penetrate the sand enough, or there's not enough oxygen for the eggs. And of course, these species have been susceptible to overfishing in the past. Other stressors can include seaweed harvesting and pollution from stormwater or other sources. So now into the nitty gritty of sandlands and surf smelt. Um, adult Pacific sandlands are these silver elongated and narrow fish growing to be about 20 centimeters long and living anywhere between five and seven years. Their distribution spans uh, basically the entire length of the Pacific Northwest coastline and across to the Sea of Japan. They spend their days feeding in the water column and their nights buried in the sandy sediment in that intertidal or subtidal regions in order to avoid predation. From November to mid-February, Pacific sandlands choose a sandy or fine pea gravel sand mixed beach to spawn on, targeting that high tide line to the mid intertidal zone. They haphazardly spawn, um, spawn, releasing their eggs that are just under a millimeter in diameter. So these eggs are quite vulnerable to dispersal by wind and wave action if they're not buried in that sand. Each egg attaches to multiple grains of sand and they will incubate in the sand for about four weeks. Surf smelt, um, similar to Pacific sandlands, have that range from about Alaska to California. They are also a silvery fish, a little bit wider and grows to be about 20 to 25 centimeters in length. Surf smelts are sexually dimorphic. The males uh, show a brown dorsal side and a yellow ventral side, and the females have a more of a bright green dorsal side and a white ventral side. Surf smelts are known to spawn year round. Um, peak spawning seasons vary regionally, but literature in Washington has noted the most commonly occurring um, June through September. Our partners in Victoria have seen spawning from January to March. They prefer beaches with small gravel and close to broadcast spawn near the high tide line. 
Regardless of the season, surf smelt spawning has been found to be linked to tidal and lunar cycles, having the greatest abundance of spawning individuals present on high evening tides accompanied by a full moon. Soon after fertilization, a small distinctive fold in the egg's membrane forms and it attaches to the substrate in one location on the, lay, on the egg and they'll incubate for about two to four weeks. So why is it important for us to be monitoring forage fish spawning? Um, the data that we can retrieve from this will enable evidence-based decisions to be made, such as modifications to policies and management plans that can help protect their spawning habitat. Beaches that they will use can have that opportunity to maintain healthy populations. Uh, the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife began monitoring forage fish species in 1971, and the systematic surveys of spawning habitat began in 1989. So they have a very extensive database um, identifying where and when Pacific sandlands and surf smelt have been spawning throughout Puget Sound, and they can use this information to then protect the intertidal regions where spawning activity is recorded. BC's knowledge regarding windows and preferential site characteristics for spawning has been adopted from the work completed in Washington State. So a lot of the information that we're getting um, has come from studies done in Washington. And MABRI, along with other organizations within British Columbia, collectively known as the BC Forage Fish Network, are working towards closing these data gaps and developing baseline data for forage fish spawning. Now, Beach Monitoring BC, just a, a small overview of what's happened in the past. Um, so to protect this crucial habitat, uh, identification of the spawning habitat is key. In British Columbia, British Columbia, there is very limited identification of spawning beaches, um, approximately three to four decades behind Puget Sound in surveying these beaches. In 2005, the BC Shore Spawners Alliance, advocated by Ramona DeGraff, started to conduct beach surveys throughout the Strait of Georgia. And from 2013 to 2018, Islands Trust Fund completed suitable spawning habitat assessments for Pacific sandlands and surf smelt in the Gulf Islands and added the possible suitable spawning habitat sites to their MAP IT site. Spawning beach data is still limited and sporadic for the BC Salish Sea, but we have been working really hard the last few years to close that and have more consistent data management. Now, our forage fish monitoring program at Mabry has five main key components to it over the last few years, and we're adding in a sixth one. Um, hopefully we can continue to work towards this in the future. So in 2017, MABRI researchers were trained by Philip Dion from the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife on forage fish sampling methods that they had developed over the years. Following the training session, we worked with Pam Thuringer, a retired marine biologist and WWF volunteer to modify the sampling methods to better suit our program. The adjustments were made because we uh, wanted to have our study focus not on the density of the spawn, but rather where the spawning was occurring. Really looking to find the beaches that support forage fish spawning, um, what we refer to as positive beaches. Some notable changes that were made were utilizing four liter plastic totes for sample collection, switching to a Wentworth sediment scale, conducting bias sampling, and including other environmental and beach station characteristics such as aspect, episodic events, and slope. Since December of 2017, Mabry has been sampling beaches along the eastern coast of Vancouver Island. Um, initially, beach stations were established and sampling efforts focused around the Parksville Qualcomm Beach Wildlife Management Area. But since then, we have greatly expanded beyond the boundaries of the MABR. During the summer of 2018, two of our research, assist research assistants at Mabry worked to identify new sample locations along our coast, building and expanding our sampling area. Currently, we have anywhere from 30 to 90 beach stations that can be sampled monthly with the help of our dedicated volunteer network. 
This number does see really large fluctuations throughout the year based on the presence of suitable sediment at the time of the visit and our volunteer capacity. Additionally, with some of the Indigenous knowledge that we have obtained over the last couple of years, some of our groups focus their sampling efforts only during the winter season, uh, which is the Pacific sandland spawning season, as surf smelt are not known to frequent their waters or visit their beaches. In the past, we had also incorporated eDNA sampling for one of our winter seasons. Um, this was included to with a hope to see how the sampling method can aid in identifying beaches that forage fish are spawning on. We would collect smaller amounts of sediment from the beaches at the same time that we collected our own sediment samples. And then the results from our efforts would be compared to the results of the eDNA collection. In early 2018, a practicum student at VIU created these predictive maps of forage fish spawning habitat using shore zone data. WWF Canada collaborated with Coastal and Ocean Resources, um, also known as CORI, to develop a predictive mapping tool to identify potential forage fish spawning beaches within BC's Salish Sea. The shore zone data was compared to the known forage fish spawning beaches to determine attributes that are associated with spawning beaches. And this really helped to further develop the shore zone predictive mapping tool. Attributes that were used uh, consisted of protected or semi-protected wave exposure, the beach form in the upper intertidal region, and the dominant substrate, and also eelgrass bioband in the subtidal region. Map outputs were produced by running codes from the established predictive table, helping to identify potential spawning habitat. And in the summer, our research assistants would visit as many of these suitable beaches as possible to really ground truth the predictive maps and solidify the areas that would be appropriate to sample at. Now, uh, in 2018 and up to now, we once we were familiar with our sampling methods, we began to expand our program and include citizen scientists. We worked to train the groups to collect and process samples within their designated areas. And thanks to funding from our partners, we were able to equip all of our citizen scientists with sampling kits and vortex kits of their own. Initially, we began training on Gabriola Island with the Gabriola Island Shorekeepers Association and Cetus Island Nature Conservancy. We worked really closely with these two groups and it allowed us to understand the difficulties and some of the hurdles that they had to jump through so we could make the necessary changes to ensure efficient sampling for anyone who was interested. Since then, we've added numerous groups and individuals and we're constantly looking to expand our geographical range and our network range. We continue to reinforce the partnerships that we have made over the last couple of years. And the creation of the BC Forage Fish Network provides us with the opportunity to share resources, validate results, and collaborate on any future initiatives surrounding forage fish. Hosting refresher sessions for our citizen scientist groups allows us to not only recruit new volunteers, but also ensure that no bad habits are adopted. And additionally, we release a bi-monthly newsletter that just keeps our citizen scientists and our partners engaged and involved. Now, looking forward, uh, Mabry will be collaborating with our partners in the BC Forage Fish Network to work on restoration efforts on select beach stations. And this can range from soft shore work uh, to beach nourishment as well. So as a short overview, uh, Mabry has been involved since 2017. We currently have 107 established beach stations ranging from Deep Bay South to Cowichan Bay on the Eastern coastline of Vancouver Island. And we also have four um, Gulf Islands that are currently sampling, Gabriola, Thetis, Pender and Saturna. As of this past March, we, alongside of our Citizen Science Network, have collected um, just over 1,500 samples. And to date, we have 35 beach stations on 29 different beaches that have had positive detections of Pacific sand lands. All of our positive detections have been Pacific sand lands. 
Now the map here on the left side uh, will show a, a pretty general overview of our sample area. It does cut off Saturna and Pender, so I've just included those on the right here. The yellow squares are indicating sites that our citizen scientists sample at, and the blue ones are the sites that our MABRI team will, will sample at. As I said, we have 107 sites throughout Eastern Vancouver Island, and of those, 68 of them are assigned to our citizen scientists. So really without their involvement and their dedication, uh, we would not have been able to expand our program geographically, and we're really continuing to look for new groups to partner with and continue that expansion. The data collection methods were slightly modified for our citizen scientists primarily reducing the amount of equipment necessary, but ensuring that the most important information is still being collected. Each group varies in size, how they undertake the sampling. Some groups con conduct all of the sampling and processing as one. Others split into pairs and work in smaller teams to sample and process or just sample. And generally, the teams will choose beaches that are close to them for ease of access and also a sense of connection. MABRI's role in the coordination involves providing support to the volunteers, providing equipment and maintenance, supplying sampling schedules, hosting training and refresher events, sharing results, and of course, completing the data entry at the end. We currently have nine citizen scientist groups who have trained and are continuing to work with us. Gabriel Island Shorekeepers, Thetis Island Nature Conservancy, the Mid Vancouver Island Habitat Enhancement Society, Qualcomm Beach Streamkeepers, Couch and Valley Estuary, uh, sorry, Couch and Valley Naturalists, Couch and Estuary Restoration and Conservation Association, the Couch and Secondary School, Pender Island Conservancy Association, and the Saturna Island Marine Research and Education Society. Additionally, um, our collaboration with the BC Forge Fish Network has provided us with strong partnerships with organizations that uh, surround the Salish Sea, including Project Watershed, Slay with Tooth Nation, Peninsula Streams and Shorelines, Loon Foundation, Sunshine Coast, Friends of Forge Fish, How Sound Biosphere Region Initiative, and the Friends of Samiamu Bay. This network has been working hard to minimize those data gaps and ensure that we're covering as much geographical area as possible. And many of these organizations also host their own network of citizen scientists who conduct a bulk of the sampling and processing. So we're all really fortunate to have um, such a dedicated group. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the methodology that we use to conduct forage fish spawning habitat monitoring. There are uh, about four or five key components to this. So the first one we have is sample collection. Samples are collected only when a site um, is deemed as having suitable sediment at the time of the visit. This will really vary depending on the season and the beach that you're at. There are some beaches within our arsenal that are really dynamic. So any time of the year, we can have completely different sediment from a really soft sand and pea gravel mix to large cobble. And depending on what you're visiting, uh, you might not take a collection, but you might as well. When we are looking for suitable habitat for Pacific sand lance, we look for pea gravel uh, with a sand base or just straight sand. And for surf smelt, we look for pea gravel mixed with pebble gravel, but still has that sand base. Scoops of sediment are collected along a 30 meter measuring tape and placed into a four liter container. Um, various beach characteristics are recorded to determine if there are any correlations to spawning activity. The characteristics and the photos recorded, um, if not by us, but by the citizen scientist are then sent to us and then we will conduct the data entry. Sample processing has two components to it. The first is sieving. So the collected sample, um, the sediment sample, is then transferred to three sieves and processed down to obtain a collection of sediment that the embryos would attach to. We sieve the sample through three different sieves, a 4.0, 2.0, and 0.5 millimeter sieve. We keep whatever is remaining in that 0.5 millimeter sieve and we place it into another holding container. 
Sieving allows us to focus our efforts on the sediment that has the highest probability of containing the eggs. Our next sample process is vortexing. So the sediment that was collected in that 0.5 millimeter sieve is then processed through this vortex machine. The vortex machine is this uh, new and most efficient way of processing samples that was developed by Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. The recirculating system pumps water from a large tote using a bilge pump run off of a marine battery, and it goes right into the blue bowl at the top. The blue bowl has a raised center with a hole in the middle, and it allows a water vortex to be created by the force of the pump. The movement of the water creates a pressure gradient with the lower pressure occurring in the center. And this low pressure system allows the lighter materials such as organics to be lifted through the water column and dropped through the center hole where it is caught in the 0.5 millimeter sieve just sitting below it. We use a spatula to agitate the sediment um, in the system as it's circulating so that we can ensure any eggs that might be buried underneath the sand still have that chance of being lifted up through the water column. That elevated hole in the center reduces the amount of sand that leaves the bowl, redu uh, sorry, reduces the amount of sand that leaves the bowl, which also reduces the amount of sand that later needs to be analyzed under the dissecting microscope. And once the processing is complete, the sediment remaining on the sieve is then transferred to a sample jar and that initial four liter container of, um, of sediment fits into a small jar um, containing only up to maybe a few inches of sediment. This really does vary though. If you have an extremely sandy sample, you might find that the jar can be completely filled with sand, um, but oftentimes this is a pretty good representation of what the average amount of sediment is. Next up, we have sample analysis. So MABRI conducts all of the analysis on the samples that we collect, but also that our citizen scientists collect. We use a dissecting scope that you can see in the image on the left here. And about a teaspoon amount of sediment at a time is thoroughly looked at on a Petri dish to find any eggs that it might contain. And we do have to go through the entire sample. There are some times where you find an egg in just your very last scoop. So it's really important that we're looking at the entire sample. The number of eggs within a sample and the species type is recorded for each sample. And even if there are none, we still record that. Any embryos that are found or any eggs that are found are going to be confirmed by experts in the field. And after the sample analysis is completed, we will update all of our groups on their findings, positive or non-detection. Now, if you look at this blue circle here that I just popped up on the screen, that's gonna show you what we're looking for in the scope. So this is a Pacific sand lance egg that has quite a few grains of sand attached to it. And in that same photo, you can see a number of eggs. There's one on either side of it, and then a couple just below. In the photo on the top in the middle, this shows another large collection of eggs. And keep in mind that this isn't what the sample looks like all the time underneath the microscope. This was after we had already um, fished out a ton of different eggs. So it's an, a nice better view of what they all look like collected together. So after sample analysis is the lovely fun part of data entry and storage. Our team compiles all the data sheets, we complete QA, QC on them, and we input the information first into our internal database. From there, we ex export the data and submit it twice a year to the Pacific Salmon Foundation Strait of Georgia Data Center. That is an open access database that is hosted at UBC. And this has been adopted also by all of the members in the BC Forge Fish Network. It's in an effort to ensure all the data is transparent and available to anyone who may use it, um, specifically for use in poli policy management. The team at the Strait of Georgia Data Center have created really beautiful maps that visually showcase monitoring efforts and our results. So I highly suggest um, you check it out if you're interested. 
Now, currently we have found 107 positive samples from 32 different beach stations. And in particular, as I mentioned, they are all Pacific sand lands. So this map here will show you our positive detections. The yellow is the positive detections and the blue are our non-detections. Just this shaded yellow orange uh, denotes the Mount Aerosmith biosphere region. We do sample monthly um, year round, but our detections have only been occurring in the winter months from November to February, which is known Pacific sandland spawning season. So revisiting sample sites consistently throughout the year helps us determine where and when the fish are spawning. Resampling helps us identify if there have been any changes to spawning habitat, spawning conditions, or spawning events. And identifying changes in the composition or parameters that are collected could influence whether or not forage fish are going to use the beach for spawning. Community knowledge contributes to the reasoning for revisiting sites. Many sites we sample at are at the recommendation of citizen scientists who recall spawning events from years ago. This past winter, we had nine egg detections in November, 23 egg detections in December, and five in January, supporting that literature of Pacific sandland spawning windows. While we didn't find um, any eggs in February, our results are still mirroring quite nicely to what we have seen in our past sampling efforts. This graph shows the positive detections from our previous year winter monitoring in the open but blue outlined boxes on the top. And it compares to our most recent one that I had just showed you with the darker colored and blue boxes. As you can see, majority of our positive detections do fall in December, but we're still seeing evidence of spawning from November to February. And this past winter monitoring season, there were 18 different beach stations in eight regions that were recurring positives. And this just means that we have had evidence of egg detections on those beach stations in previous years. And that's really important for us to see repeat spawning. The hexagons are just going to denote the different regions and the number in parentheses will represent how many beach stations had those recurring positives. Some of our notable beach stations that we would have considered our core stations were Sunny Beach in Bowser, Community Park Beach and San Perel in Parksville, Sebastian Beach in Lanceville, Icarus Park and Departure Bay in Nanaimo, Maple Bay Beach and Pilot Bay on Gabriola Island. While we're extremely excited to have a ton of recurring positives um, this year and in past years, it's even more exciting to have new beaches with egg detections as well. So in five of our regions, again represented in the hexagons here, we sampled seven beach stations that had positive detections for the first time. Some of these beach stations were sampled in the past um, and they didn't have positive detections and others are new beaches that we did just begin sampling. Some of our more notable beach stations include Ore Road Beach in Lanceville, Piper's Lagoon in Nanaimo, West Can Dyke in Cowichan Bay and Whalebone Beach on Gabriola Island. So all of this work that we've been doing over the past few years, what is it contributing to? Um, definitely nearshore education and involvement by the citizen scientists, um, hoping for evidence-based policy and management modifications down the line, and better conservation tactics to preserve the marine food web's lifeline. And just before I, I say my thank yous, I do want to mention our Forager newsletter. So every two months we send out this newsletter, the Forager. It updates our citizen scientists, community members, partners on our findings, some forage fish facts, upcoming training sessions, and any other additional information that groups would like to share with one another, such as helpful tips and tricks for sampling or processing. This is really one of our um, 
our main methods of keeping citizen scientists informed and engaged. It helps us reach out to the public. It helps us recruit more volunteers. We just published our 19th edition um, in the beginning of April. And if anyone is interested in being a part of the distribution list, please just reach out to me and I'd be happy to include you. So lastly, I just want to take this moment to thank our funders and thank our partners because without their support, we wouldn't be where we, where we are today and we're really grateful for the collaborations and the partners that we've made along the way. And especially thank you to all 47 of you there uh, for tuning in and please feel free to reach out to me with any questions, comments or suggestions. Um, I believe we have some time for questions after this, but I'll, I'll let um, Philip comment on that. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Alana. Uh, yes, I'm sure there's probably some questions. Uh, maybe I'll start. I'm just curious if um, sandlands are more common in the protected waters like of Georgia Strait as opposed to Juan de Fuca Strait. Is there any difference that you know of? You know, I have to admit that most of the work that we have been doing um, isn't related to population estimates. So I'm not positive how the population in the Strait of Georgia um, relates to Puget Sound. Um, I, from, from my brief, you know, knowledge of their spawning spawning beaches in Puget Sound, I would like to say that they have a lot more of known positive spawning beaches than we currently have in British Columbia. Um, maybe that is an indication of population size, but I, I don't know for certain. I was thinking in particular, uh, say the Victoria region, if uh, there is there an active um, sampling uh, around Victoria? Yeah, absolutely. Oh. So project, uh, sorry, Peninsula Streams and Shorelines in Victoria are really the, um, the group down there who organized citizen science sampling of forage fish spawning habitat monitoring. Um, they have had positives for both Pacific Sandlands and surf smelt in their areas. And uh, it's really exciting. They do lots of work all around the Saanich uh, Peninsula and throughout Victoria's Southern region. So lots of opportunity for anyone in the Victoria region to, to be a part of forage fish monitoring. Right. I'll just look in the chat here. Um... Sandlands eggs look green. Does that indicate that algae may have entered the eggs? Um, you know, sometimes the coloration that we're seeing in our photos is due to the solution that we store them in. We try to preserve the eggs for educational purposes. So I have noticed that over time, um, our eggs maybe are not so clear and transparent, but a little bit more cloudy and opaque and sometimes turning a little bit yellow too. So the, the discoloration might be just from our, um, our solution that we use to store them in. Hmm. Uh, here's another comment. Uh, is it absolutely known that sandlands do not spawn in subtidal areas? It seems like there's a huge biomass out there and you are finding only a few eggs. Uh, it, is, it is not absolutely known that sandlands do not spawn in subtidal areas. That is certainly a question that is being explored. Um, um, specifically from a, you know, um, a master's student at UBC. She, they have done work on some subtitle burrowing habitat, and there's always been talk of subtitle spawning. Um, we are collecting, you know, only a, a few eggs. We do only take a, a small amount, but sometimes the egg counts in our samples can be anywhere from two eggs to over 1,500 eggs in the sample. So um, there are often times that we're, we're seeing quite a number of eggs in our, in our collections and oftentimes we're not seeing as many. And I'm not sure of the variability. It could be that we caught the spawn at the wrong time, um, but it, it, it does vary in number of eggs in a sample. When, when I indicated that we had you know, nine eggs in January or 23 egg detections in um, December, I should have clarified, I definitely more meant you know, nine of our samples that we collected 
it had egg detections, 23 of the samples had egg detections, but those numbers will fluctuate um, anywhere from a really small one or two up to 1,500. I see. Uh, another, here's another question. When sandlands spawn, do they attract birds and other predators like spawning herring? You know, I'm not positive. I, I don't know. I have never got to witness a spawning event. Um, when I have when we visited beaches and we collected samples that we knew that we found out later were positives, we ha have not seen any increase of um, of predators on the beach at that time. But in the moment of a high tide event during a spawning activity, we have unfortunately never got to witness that. So I can't speak to the moment of the spawn, but I can speak to a low tide event after the spawn that we are not seeing an increase of predators on the beach um, grazing on the, the eggs. Do they tend to spawn at night as opposed to during the day, even though it's high tide? Well, when when we're finding the spawning of uh, when we're collecting the sediment samples, um, we collect them at a low tide event, and and a lot of the time in the winter, these low low tide events are happening um, more overnight. So mm -hmm. the high tide events in the winter are more so during the daytime, um, but we really try to time it around full moon events because those will bring in the highest tides and. Um, you know, that's when we're expecting them to, to come up and spawn because they'll have the greatest area available to, to spawn. So it's really just dependent on um, the time of the high tide, whether that be in the day or, or in the night. Mm -hmm. uh, here's another question. Is it possible to identify eggs with UV or other light sources? Um, I'm not sure about UV, but we have been talking about exploring the idea of um, using dyes in our samples. So after you've sieved down your sample and, and vortexed it down, um, putting some dye in it, and then hopefully that can change the color of an egg and that makes it easier to identify. We haven't tried it yet, um, but we are looking to partner with some some research students in their fourth year and hopefully they can conduct a study to, to determine if that can help us um, identify and speed up that process of, of identification. Mm -hmm. uh, the, um, it, does walking on the beach damage eggs? I'd like to say that they're quite resilient. The amount of work that we put them through from picking up, you know, that scooping up the sample, um, sieving it through the sieves and agitating it through the blue bowl, we're still finding them quite intact. So I don't think necessarily um, just walking along the beach will produce that much damage to the eggs. I think um, digging or, you know, um, equipment going up and down on the beach might be something that is a more concern. Um, but uh, walking up and down, I mean, we're still finding the fully intact eggs, um, even after all of us collecting it and processing it down, so. Hmm. Okay. I was wondering if there's any correlation between the numbers you find and the weather, like if it's really cold or warmer than usual, for example. Yeah, um, we have been collecting a lot of those characteristics um, over the years to see if there's a correlation. Um, from the last time we did some statistical analyses, we haven't seen a correlation between um, either episodic events or you know, current weather conditions. But again, the data set was quite small at the time. So hoping within the next few years, us along with the BC Forge Fish Network um, with a, a larger comprehensive data set, we can look more into those relationships between spawning activity and um, you know, beach characteristics or, or current weather events. Right. Uh, are there any more questions out there? If you'd like to unmute or put your, oh, here's, a, here's another one in the uh, chat. What is the gestation period from time laid to time hatched? Um, four weeks. Four weeks um, for the Pacific Sandlands, two to four weeks for surf smelt as well. 
um, from when we're the, the incubating into the sand and then they will hatch and then release back into the water. Okay. And do these beach spawners spawn repeatedly in a season or over years? Over years, absolutely. We are seeing repeat spawners on our beaches. We have, um, I would like to say anywhere between six and 10 beaches that we have seen repeatedly every winter are repeat spawning beaches. Um, for uh, repeatedly in a season, there are uh, only a couple of our beaches that we have seen uh, a spawning event, let's say in late November, and then again in December or in early January. Um, while the numbers are quite different, they're not usually of the same um, magnitude of the count, sorry, of the egg count. We still are seeing what potentially could be maybe a second spawning event, or maybe they're just in the sand a little bit longer than we expected. But. And uh, how deep are the eggs in the sand? Uh, we only dig down about uh, two inches deep oh. and just collect from that, just a small, just a small little collection from the top of the sediment. Okay. Uh, another question, do spawn, uh, smelt spawn elsewhere in BC? Yes, <laughs> um, not very much. Our forage fish network is having great luck with Pacific sand lands, not so much with surf smelt. Um, I believe the Sunshine Coast has seen a surf smelt um, in the past, but I know that our more solid positives of surf smelt have been happening in Southern Vancouver Island um, in Victoria. So we're not sure where the surf smelt are, but we're trying to find them. I assume they're uh, in places where there's a bit more surf, <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, here's, let's see. Oh, did you, uh, here's a publication about Mabry. Yes. Oh, yes, I see. Um, thank you, Jacqueline. She has posted a link to an article that we um, we have published with in, in collaboration with WWF Canada. Um, it was on our initial findings from our forage fish monitoring program. So. Okay, so if you can, people can see that, you can get the, the link there on yes. the chat. Yeah, it's an open access journal, so it's um, free for anyone to download and, and and read. No subscription required. Okay, uh, another question. Has anyone done genetic work on the eggs to see if they are different populations on different beaches? Um, I think there, there is work being done on Pacific Sandlands through the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada. Um, whether or not it is on different populations from you know genetic work i'm not positive um yeah i i don't have i don't have information on that unfortunately but i think we might have someone who has some information to speak up <laughs> hi alana yeah so i'm jacqueline bars i'm with wwf canada so i've been contributing to the forage fish monitor network through a facilitation role and i do uh, attend meetings for the forage fish working group with fisheries and oceans canada uh, so a lot of the genetic work that's kind of being done is around environmental DNA. So it's basically trying to identify if uh, eDNA can be collected on uh, sand beaches. Uh, they haven't done a lot of genetic work on um, to, to really get an, an idea of the different populations that exist. But something that is to be known is that they have been working on a subtitle suitability um, model for burrowing habitat. And they definitely know there's distinct limitations around the amount of um, burrowing habitat in the subtitle zone in the Strait of Georgia. And the one thing that they do know through um, kind of tag retag type events done um, on the Pacific Rim area for, for past uh, uh, Pacific uh, Sandlands kind of mapping the distance that they travel, they don't really move greater than about five uh, kilometers away from their burrowing habitat. So basically you're looking for those suites of subtitle burrowing habitat. Most of the beaches kind of within the five kilometer distance would kind of belong to that kind of population that burrows in that subtitle habitat. And thus you are gonna get different populations uh, fluctuating throughout the Strait of Georgia, just in relationship to where those subtitle burrowing habitats are. Okay. 
And uh, it's like a final question. Do, do you have access to the US data to expand your database? Um, you know, I, I do not have access to their to their data. Um, I don't know if they have it, if it's hosted on an open access database or not. Um, but I know that uh, that was one of our, our key points of, of trying to move forward with the BC with the BC monitoring program is trying to ensure that all the data is accessible to anyone. Um, yeah, I, I don't believe they host their data on an open access database. So I don't know if anyone has has it. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that's the last of the questions. Uh, Jacqueline Barr says it is not, it's a state database. There we go. Oh. <laughs> there we go. So if there are any more questions, uh, if not, so Don Kramer says, thank you very much for your talk. Thank you, everyone, for listening and all of your questions. And uh, wish you well with the, the data collection. I guess it's more or less over now, is it, for the next winter? Well, we'll still be collecting uh, throughout the summer in case we oh, can find some surf smelt. Um, but yeah, we're always we're always going all okay. all year. <laughs> hey. And do you have a backlog of samples to? Uh, <laughs> Just no, no, we we are very on top. We um, analyze all of our samples within a week of collecting. So now it's just making sure we're catching up with data entry. Right. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, thank you very much, Alana. And uh, my pleasure. Jacqueline. Um, Thanks again, Alana. That was awesome. My pleasure. Thank you, everyone.